Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Elsevier Life Sciences Solutions webinar. My name is Xuanyan Xu, Senior Marketing Manager at Elsevier Life Science Solutions. I will be moderating today's webinar where we will be exploring how to automatically extract adverse events and some adverse drug reactions using AI and machine learning. Before we get started, I would like to talk about some housekeeping items. So in order to achieve the best quality of the webinar, I would suggest viewing the presentation in the full screen mode. You can find the button at the right corner of the screen. And this webinar is being recorded, and you will automatically receive the link to listen back to the webinar after the live broadcasting. The PDF of the presenta presentation slides will be made available after the webinar. And you are most welcome to join the discussion by submitting your questions during the webinar, and there will be the opportunity for our speakers to answer them at the end of the webinar. So now I'm introducing you to today's speaker, Dr. Umesh Nando. Umesh is the principal machine learning and natural language processing scientist in the content transformation department at Elsevier. The content transformation department is focused on the content production pipelines that enable Elsevier to turn the content into answers. Specifically, they combine the natural language processing and the machine learning methods with domain expertise in order to enrich content into data structures that drive the analytics. With a background in the chemistry and computational biology, Umesh is applying state-of-the-art methods in the machine learning and NLP to improve as well as build Elsevier new life sciences products. Prior to joining the Elsevier, he used the various computational approaches to analyze the molecular data generated from the high throughput technologies to understand the biological process in the healthy and diseased organisms. And during his PhD, he worked on the comparison of mouse models with humans by building a network-based integration method that can combine their biological networks. So Umesh, can you tell us more how you are applying the machine learning and NLP to improve the pharmacovigilance literature surveillance process? Hi, Joan. Yes, definitely. Thanks a lot for a nice introduction. Uh, so uh, let me start with actually uh, with some questions to put in your mind. So uh, I'm hoping that you will get answers of these questions by the end of this presentation. So. Uh, what is PV, pharmacovigilance workflow? So PV process plays a key role in healthcare systems by gathering and reporting adverse events. And it's a long manual process, time consuming process, and also expensive process. Can we automate some of the parts of the process or not? What are the significant challenges around mining adverse events from the literature or other type of contents, for example, FDA drug labels using machine learning and NLP, natural language processing? And you will also find some nice answers about probably uh, what are the essential elements to build machine learning models. Uh, so uh, I actually uh, divided up my talk today in four sections. I will start with the background about giving a little bit background about about Elsevier, what we have been working on using machine learning and AI. Uh, a little bit introduction about adverse events, the challenges in literature mining, and then I will explain our approach of extracting adverse events from literature and FDA drug labels. And also some of the applications where we can apply these machine learning models in pharmacovigilance area. And finally, we will end up with the QA session. So as you all know, Elsevier uh, as a publisher, but uh, where we actually provide answers uh, to the researchers so that they can make, make new discoveries in the form of providing uh, uh, articles so that they can read. But we are also providing answers in the form of extracting these, uh, the knowledge or the data from this literature. And we have been doing this manually for a long time. And on top of that, we are also using this data so that we can build predictive models to answer uh, answer accurate, uh, for accurate questions, we uh, can answer accurate answers so that you can better 
improve your predictions or you can answer your query in a better way. But obviously, in, if we want to accelerate in this process of extractions of information and knowledge from literature, we cannot do that manually. Uh, now, as you can see, there is a lot of articles that has been generating annually. So we apply, uh, we are applying machine learning and NLP to accelerate this process, where we are extracting not only information from the text, but also from tables, images, uh, uh, all those different types of content within a literature. And like I said, we are, we have been extracting this information manually. So you can imagine uh, this data that we have been collecting for a long time, we, I would say we are sitting on a gold mine that can be used to actually train machines so that we can build better prediction models. And as you can see, Embase, which provides a high quality with high precision information and have been curated manually for the last 50 years, it has been re recommended by the FDA and AMA and other regulatory authorities for monitoring drug safety in biomedical literature. Uh, Joan, uh, I'm here, I'm seeing a question that they don't see anything. I think I can see it. Please continue, Umesh, and let me check with the technical team. Okay. And uh, in order to build these machine learning models, we have around 200 data scientists and hundreds of uh, subject matter experts with deep domain knowledge so that we can build these prediction models and extract information with high precision and recall. Now, let's, let me give a brief definition about adverse events and adverse drug reactions. Adverse event refers to uh, any untoward medical event associated with the use of a drug in humans, which whether or not considered drug related. So usually we consider them an event that happens when a drug is taken, but it could be or it could not be causal effect of that drug. And adverse drug reactions refers to an undesirable effect which are directly having causal relationship with, with the drug. And in, in this presentation, uh, I'm going to use adverse event or adverse event, event. So I'm not making any distinction between that at the moment. And if you see, so if you see, uh, these adverse reactions have been accounted for around 5 to 10 percent of all hospital admissions. And they are the fourth to the sixth highest cause of death rates in United States. And if we can see that it's approximately 50% of adverse reactions are preventable, but still we are spending a lot of money annually to monitor these adverse reactions. And there are several sources where these adverse reactions are reported, such as local safety officers, the spontaneous reports from local safety officers, literature, FDA drug labels from regulatory authorities, emails, medical inquiries or product complaints in call centers, and people also tweet about a lot of adverse reactions uh, uh, in, in Twitter or LinkedIn. So it's also challenging to extract this information from social media. But in this talk, I'm going to focus on the literature and the FDA drug labels extractions of adverse reaction on these content. And why this is challenging to extract this information from literature. As you can see, around 2.7 million peer-reviewed research articles are published annually. And according to this rate, if you see, the entire world's medical knowledge will double every 73 days by 2020. So this is a huge amount of data that needs to be uh, used to extract this kind of information, and which is difficult when we start extracting this manually. But extraction of information is also uh, challenging when uh, compare when it, when you start doing automatically because it's most of the times that the content is unstructured with text tables images and you need both the domain knowledge as well as data science knowledge in order to extract uh, relevant information from the literature so next i will show you how we are actually extracting this information so if you see in this slide I'm showing you a kind of a, 
a general supervised machine learning approach. A supervised means where we are training the machines with the labeled data. So you start with the training data, which we in text mining world we call, call it as gold standard corpus, because I know in several other domains we just call it training data. But in text mining world we call it gold standard corpus, which is manually curated and labeled. Once we, uh, and in order to feed machine to understand this data, we need to translate it to machine understandable language. So we convert that text data into digital information so that machine can understand. And this conversion of text to digital, we call, digital, we call it as natural language processing. Once the machine is trained, then we can have a prediction model and ready. And when you have a new content to predict or to identify information, you feed into the prediction model and then you identify the information or predictions. So let's start with the gold standard, uh, why it is important. Uh, so what is the gold standard? With gold standard is a manually curated high quality reference set based on product need for training and validating computer predictions. So obviously uh, the definition of a gold standard, definition in terms of the performance of the gold standard can vary based on the requirement or, de or depending on the use case that you're looking for. Uh, and why it is important because it can provide the comparison with the prediction models correct. It doesn't miss any stuff. And so that we have uh, relevant information extracted with, because we are comparing with the gold standard. And all the predictions that we are comparing with is consistent, uh, consistently validated with the gold standard. What are the benefits of using gold standards? As I said, GoSense allows as a standard tool to compare with different, uh, to d with different prediction models without any additional cost. You can use the same gold standard repeatedly for different, to, uh, to, uh, to validate the quality of different tools. And that's why it's strictly fair. You're not, using, you're not comparing apples with oranges. You're always comparing apples with apples. You can scale it easily. It is suitable to train, uh, to use for natural language processing and also for machine learning approaches. It also represents the performance of human. That's, that's the main uh, idea of having a gold standard, that it captures the, the variance of uh, human subjects because every human has their uh, subjective knowledge. It captures that variation and that we can use in order to uh, evaluate the quality of the prediction model and which is how we uh, and in order to see how much variance is there between each annotator who are building the gold standard we, we actually we use that as an inter annotator agreement the only cost that we see in uh, this approach is building the gold standard because uh, it can be a very painful process to develop a gold standard uh, in order to build the proper guidelines depending on the complexity of the process. The guidelines creation could be easy or complex. Uh, but obviously once the gold standard is created, you have consistent annotations. So how are we actually comparing our predictions with against the gold standard? We, uh, like everybody, we also use precision recall and F-score precision is the measure where you identify uh, precision is a, a measure which we aware uh, when a machine is predicting, uh, machine has predictions, and if it's predicting correctly all the, all the predictions correctly against the gold standard, then the precision is 100%. For example, in the first case, first circle on the right-hand side, you see here, out of two yellow circles, we predicted only one, so then the prediction precision is 100%. But because it missed one of the gold standard circle, the, the recall drops down to 50%. In the second circle, you see that both circles are predicted. So both it's a percent precision, 100% recall. When it, when it is predicting something extra or false positive, then the precision goes down. But still the recall is higher because it is extracting all the two yellow circles. And the harmonic mean of precision and recall is uh, called F-score. So this is the common measure that we are using uh, in order to evaluate the quality of machine learning models. 
So how are we building goal set at Elsevier? We are using a BRAT, uh, a toolkit which is freely available. It can work online. It's very easy to use and install. And it can allow multiple anno annotations uh, from different annotators. So if you can see on the right-hand side, there is an example. Uh, this is an example of text. Uh, and you see in the bottom when the annotations are done. So uh, these are the entities, the words that you are interested in are tagged and the relations between them, how they are related with each other. So I'm going to explain also how, what kind of data we are using in building the uh, machine learning model. So this is the approach that we are we have been following in order to build a goal set. Uh, because it's a very important uh, task, uh, as every uh, following step is dependent on this, because the, the predictions from the machine will be dependent on how your goal standard is. If you're feeding in garbage to the goal standard, to your machine learning model, then your prediction will be garbage. So you have to really show that your goal standard is really, really good and manually curated with high quality. So first you define what entities and relationship types you are actually looking for. Uh, so you define the annotation, you, you build the guidelines for annotating these entities and relations. And then you send it to annotators along with the corpus that you're interested in uh, to use for uh, training the machines. The annotators annotate the document and then we receive them back in order to verify how the annotations what is the inter-annotator agreement. And we don't send the corpus completely at one time. We send the corpus in batches because we want to see if annotators understood our guidelines or not. So we need to make sure that they are consistently annotating and have a similar interpretation of any type of entity. And in order to check that, we calculate this inter-annotator agreement score, which, is, which we calculate using Cohen's Kappa. Once the inter-annotator agreement uh, score reaches above 0.5, uh, we say that this can be a good goal standard that can be used to train the machines. Usually we, uh, we take uh, uh, inter-annotator score as 0.7 to 0.8 as a good, goal, a good corpus for training the machine. But how do once, because here we are, uh, we, are, we are getting the annotations from multiple annotators, so we are using a scheme called harmonization scheme because in the end you want to feed in the machine a single annotations. So as you can see on the right hand side you have uh, annotations from three annotators stacked on top of each other. So in harmonization, one of the approaches of harmonization is that you, you do a voting system. So if two out of three, two annotators are agreeing on a single annotation then we keep it. So this is one of the approach, but there are several other approaches that you can use to harmonize it on the gold standard. So in uh, our, uh, for, our, for training our models for adverse drug reactions, we are using three different types of gold standards. We started with a publicly available gold standard called TAC, TAC gold standard, which was actually released from, uh, in one of the challenges uh, from NIH. Uh, this contains FDA drug labels. And uh, the content in these goals that are is coming from only few of the sections from FDA drug labels, adverse reaction, box warning, warning, and precautions. Uh, because uh, you cannot always rely on publicly available goals depending on the requirements that you have. So when they when when somebody else is building or developing a goal set, they have different requirements. So we want to fulfill our requirement in that goal set. So that's why we also extended this tech goal set uh, with some other new entities and data sets and sentences or uh, documents. We are also using another corpus, which is a literature-based corpus. It's also publicly available corpus called ADE corpus, which has uh, adverse drug reaction, drugs and dosage entities. So I'm going to show you in detail what different types of entities we have in our goal sets. So in tag goals that we have around uh, six entities, so adverse re reaction is an entity, another entity is severity, which identify the severity of an adverse reaction, whether it's a critical, serious, or identify whether the grade, what kind of grading, gra uh, severity grade is this uh, adverse reaction, what class of drug it is in, uh, it, this adverse reaction belongs to. 
whether the adverse drug reaction is negated means if in a sentence it's mentioned that uh, this uh, particular adverse reaction is not from this, so that's a negation. And whether it has been, uh, the adverse reaction has been observed in animals. Uh, somebody is hearing echo. Maybe, uh, Juan, can you maybe mute all the audiences? Uh, all the audiences are <coughs> mute. Yes, please continue. Uh, and we are also using factor as another entity which which says whether it's, whether it's the instead of drug a placebo was used or it was a potential or a risk. And in order to, audio is lost. Umesh, don't worry. Um, I think okay. there are technical issues more from the uh, okay. nurse side. Okay. On our side, it's all fine. I just check with our technical team. So please continue. Okay, okay thanks, Joanne. Uh, and in order to uh, identify whether a drug is related to a specific adverse event, we uh, define these different relations. So like I mentioned, whether a drug is, if an adverse reaction is mentioned, but it says that it's not a drug reaction, then we relate it with negated. If it's a hypothetical, if it says it's may or risk or it's potential re adverse reaction, we say it as a hypothetical, if we relate it with hypothetical entity. And if it's a severe, if an adverse reaction is severe, then we link severity and adverse reaction with an effect relation, like you see in the right hand side in the examples, there is a, there is a seriousness entity and they are related here as an, with an adverse reaction. So in Elsevier goal set, we are extending these entities with drug administration route, dosage, and combinations and disease. And on the bottom of the of this slide, you can see actually how we are converting uh, these annotations into an annotation file. So for example, in this case, we have a dose reaction behavioral change <coughs> from Sinipazide. So you see on the right-hand side, this is called a BRAT annotation file where you have the entity name and then you have an entity type and the entity offsets, the starting and ending position and the, then the entity that you're observing or extracting. So let me go a further details about uh, the statistics of our goal set. So as you see on the left hand side, DAG goal set, we have almost around 13,000 adverse drug reactions labeled, majority of them. Uh, we have around 8,000 uh, sentences in this goal set. Uh, in Elsevier goal set, we have around 4,000 uh, sentences and around 5,000 uh, adverse drug reactions. And in literature, we have only three types of entities, adverse drug reaction, drug, and dosage. And in this prediction model, we are extracting only at the moment adverse drug reactions and you see that the training data could be small here. So for example, here you see there is there are only 4,000 uh, data points uh, in uh, for FDA drug level and around 4,000 also in, in the literature. So this could be a problematic because in order, to, in order for you that the machine should perform well, it should be fitted in with a, uh, with a good amount of goal set. So you don't know how much you need to feed in, but usually the more you feed in, the better your results predictions you get. The more you train the machine with more data, more better predictions with high accuracy you get. So this I will show you how we can deal with this problem uh, if you have a limited amount of goal set, what you can do in terms of machine learning. So let's recap. Uh, so what we are using as a gold standard as two types of content, uh, two types of text. One is gold FDA drug label, which we have TAC and Elsevier gold set, and one is literature gold set. So uh, any question for this part, or should I move forward? Uh, yeah, let me have a look, Umesh. I think there are two interesting questions, but maybe I will just address them now, and then we can look at and then discuss the answers at the end. Um, the first question is, do you think that the machines can co perform better than the GOAT set? Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's a very, that, yeah, that's a very good question, and, and it's, it's a tricky question as well, because that's, that's why we build a GOAT set, and that's why we also calculate inter-annotator agreement, so that we can have a measure if an inter-annotator agreement is around 80%. So we should not expect that the machine 
is going to perform better than that because if humans are not agreeing with each other then we kind of think that this is a we, we need to imagine that this is a complex problem if the agreement is below five, 50 percent but it depends a lot on the complexity of the task so probably you will see that sometimes the predictions are better because uh, we use a better technology or uh, or the problem that we are solving may be easy. Okay. Second question, and then after this, we're going to move on. What do you think is the most challenging part of building a prediction model? Uh, well, I would say uh, goal set development. It's challenging. Uh, there are other parts of the machine learning called Python, which is challenging as well. But the main, okay. main, uh, the challenging part is goal set because if your goal setting is not, is not, is not very well quality goal set, then your prediction models will suffer from the low quality goal standard or training data. Okay, so Maybe shall we then, pause uh, here yeah, yeah, and we address yeah, the rest yeah. of the questions at the end? So let's move yeah. on. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, give you a very brief. Uh, concepts about how we are converting the text into digital information to feed into the machine. So these are the basic steps in text mining in NLP. That you take the raw, you convert, you you split the paragraph into sentence, you update, you convert them into tokens, and you add part of speech information, and then finally you start analyzing the entities. Once you have the entities information, then you start detecting the relations. As an example, Let's see here. So this is a this this is a paragraph of two sentences. So in ten, sentence segmentation, you can you split into two sentences and then you split into tokens. So with these tokens, the, these tokens can then be used to uh, to feed into machine as features. For example, you can calculate the frequency of these terms. You can calculate the frequency and inverse document frequency. I'm not going to go into the details. Just to give an overview. You can create the vectors from these words generated from this uh, tokenization, or you can use embeddings, which are pre-trained language models based on a corpus that also use neural networks. For example, here you see recently uh, in NLP, this has been uh, really been used uh, and provide and give very promising results for events, especially when you have a, a low number of data points to feed it or train your machine. For example, here BERT is pre-trained on uh, on book chapters and, and English Wikipedia, and BioBert is specifically trained on biomedical domain on PubMed abstracts and full text articles. And this is another type of scheme that you actually extract information so that this you can use in terms of uh, feature to fit into the machine. For example, here you see that gemc uh, turbine related radiation recall in a patient with pancreatic cancer. So radiation recall is an adverse reaction, so we actually identify what is the beginning and the inside of this entity and what is the outside of this entity. And we can also see that there is a drug is here, so what is the beginning of the drug and the outside is here. So this information we can use, all these type, different types of features we can use to train our machines. So identifying these different types of entities we call as named entity recognition. And if you are identifying biomedical entities, we call that as biomedical named entity recognition. And if you see in this example, I'm showing what are the complexities or challenges in identifying entities in uh, drug, uh, adverse drug reaction <coughs> extractions. So for example, if you see on the first hand side, you have a sentence, disorientation, trouble br breathing, extreme heart readiness and swelling each later abdomen cramps, which is a simple sentence and you can extract each word uh, from here, which and these entities are not overlapping. But if you see in pain in knee and pain in foot means you are extracting pain in knee and pain in foot, so this is an overlapping. You can have a discontinuous or non-overlapping entities. For example, my liver blood tests are also mildly elevated. So you have liver blood test mildly elevated is a discontinuous uh, kind of entity that you want to extract. And similarly, you have this discon discontinuous overlapping uh, from pain in knee and pain in foot. So these are some of the challenging uh, challenges that uh, once you, when you start extracting entities which, which constitutes multi-word uh, entities.
which usually happens when you start extracting adverse drug reactions. So let's recap again. So what we are using now, we are using FDA drug label as gold set. We are using literature for uh, gold set for ADE. And we can use different types of features, <coughs> term frequency, content, bigram, tiger, tri or four gram means multiple words. Actually, if you say two words combination, you use part of speech, you use biotag, word to vec embeddings. Now I will, ex uh, I will go into uh, the detail about the machine learning models. So there are several approaches in machine learning models. Here I'm presenting. Uh, one of the approaches, you're just using dictionaries. So you just feed in the dictionary uh, of uh, words into your, into your uh, algorithm, and then it will identify the terms or entities that are specifically mentioned in your dictionary. Or you can also create your dictionary from a corpus. For example, if we have a word set, what we can do, we can use that to extract all the words and concepts and we can create a dictionary from that. Usually it's exact word matching or you can, there are also several other ways where actually you don't, you can do fuzzy matching as well. Another approach is conditional random field which is a probabilistic model and here also you can, it's, it's a different, it's a sequential based model and it's not like dictionary based approach and in this also you can in this specifically, so in dictionary-based approach, you don't use the features that you use in machine learning like conditional random field or neural networks. So here it, you use part of speech, you, you, you can use the bio-tagging, you can use random sentence or the actual token itself, the token means of words. Another approach is, apart from other classical approaches like support vector machine or regression models or decision trees, the another approach is, which has now been very famous the neural networks, one of the approaches is bi-directional long short-term memory. These are recurrent neural networks which reads in both directions and here you can use characters and word embeddings. Uh, so if you remember I mentioned uh, if, you have a, uh, if you have a problem of having a small amount of goals set, how you deal with that problem because you know you don't have enough data to train your machine so you're expecting low accuracy or precision on recall. So if you see on the left hand side, tradition, in traditional machine learning approaches, when you have sufficient amount of data, you build your prediction model based on that data. So you say you have a data set one, you have data set two, you build two separate models. Now, for example, in our case, we have tech, we have LZV goal set, we have ADE goal set. And these are sufficiently okay in terms of size to um, train the machine, but we, we we see that we still need much more number of data points to train the machine to to get, uh, uh, yes, the NER aligned with Metro. <laughs> uh, so uh, to train the machine. So in this case, what we are doing, we are actually using transfer learning. In transfer learning, what you do, we, you actually take the bigger corpus. So for example, here, we took BioBot, which have been trained on the life sciences domain for from PubMed articles and for full text articles. And from this uh, training, you actually transfer the features to your uh, to different to your uh, wireless teams here, to your under training model. But you're also so it's kind of you're extending your feature space. And we see that the performance is really good when you uh, use transfer learning. I will show you the results soon. Uh, so again, let's recap so that we can uh, keep up like what uh, we have done. So we are using these gold standards and now we are using four different types of approaches to build machine learning models, dictionary based approach, CRF, BioList team and BioWord. Let's see the results now. So if you see uh, the results of a prediction model. So uh, it's clearly visible that when you use dictionary based approach, your precision recall and F-score is really low and there is a significant change or increase in the performances when you move from a dictionary based approach to conditional random field and to neural networks of BioBird. So now you see that BioBird actually playing a really key role here to improve the performance of prediction model. So in TAG goals that we are achieving around 92%, which is really a very nice uh, uh, performance of the model. For adverse, for ADE, it drops to 84, but still it's good in terms of if you see as compared like at the bottom of this page, you see that uh, the scores which have been 
previously reported were around 85 or 86. So we are at least getting around similar prediction scores for uh, literature mining. And uh, you have to keep in mind that tag data is completely different than ADE goal set or Elsevier goal set because the tag goal set is coming from FDA drug labels and the structure is very different than the literature content. The language is also different. Uh, so there could be challenges. There are various challenges when you start mining literature. So uh, in summary, this is our, uh, it's a bit complicated, but just to uh, give you an overview of uh, uh, how does our uh, prediction pipeline looks like. So you have FDA, SPL, uh, FSP, which we actually use as SPL documents in XML format and literature. We extract the text and we feed into our uh, machine learning pipeline. Uh, so there it extracts. We are actually separating both tables and uh, text. Uh, we are having separate pipeline for extraction of information or entities from tables and text, which makes sense because tables have completely different type of format and it's different if you uh, start looking into the language. So yes. So uh, some of the, uh, so we extract the sentences, we fit in the sentences in the prediction model, and we extract, uh, once we have the entities extracted, we extract the relations and we document the annotations and put that back into our results bucket. So this is just to give an overview how the, uh, how the production pipeline looks like. Let's move on to the application, how we can apply these models uh, in a pharmacovigilance uh, workflow. So probably most of you know uh, uh, the standard workflow or the process that needs to be followed in uh, when you start uh, 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 monitoring the adverse drug reactions from different types of content. So you, there is a case input coming from different resources, you intake the case, you process the case, so here a case could be an article, case could be an FDA drug label, could be uh, EHR or EMR, and then you process and then you, once you have processed the cases, then you identify whether the case is ICSR, individual case reporting relevant or not, and then you aggregate the data into periodic reports, and finally it goes for uh, analysis, whether when the signals are identified so how can we actually overlap our uh, predictions on this whole manual workflow? What, what are the processes that we can automate? So let's see here. So uh, what we see here, for example, uh, now you have a literature coming in. Uh, we can identify, once the literature coming in, we can identify, we can classify into triads because we are extracting adverse reaction and also the seriousness or the severity uh, of the relation uh, with the adverse reaction. So we can, based on the severity or seriousness, we can uh, classify as a serious case or non-serious case. Once we actually identify uh, all these different entities, adverse drug reaction, drug, we are not extracting patient and reported information yet, but, uh, but extending our goal set to patient and reported information is uh, not that hard to extend, which can be extended easily. But once we have these four different types of entities extracted, we can say whether it's an ICSR relevant document or not. And because we are extracting adverse drug reaction in each of these documents, uh, we can compare with FAIRS database, which has uh, all the list of known adverse drug reaction, and we can compare whether this extracted new adverse drug reaction is something new that we are capturing. Uh, so we are with, by comparison, we can identify the signals. So the signals are the adverse drug reactions that have not been reported or mentioned in FAIRS databases. So those uh, new adverse reactions identified in literature. After this, uh, uh, all these extractions, then it can go for uh, uh, final manual curation or analysis. So let me uh, summarize or what we saw 
probably you also got some of your answers that you were seeking for. So in pharmacovigilance workflow, how much we can automate? So we see that we, for now, we can automate the triage, ICS relevant. Uh, we can identify whether an, a document, a case is an ICS relevant or not. We can identify signals. And if you see, based on our experience, manual annotation usually takes identification of the signals or adverse reaction or whether it's ICA relevant or not, usually takes an on an average one to two minutes. And that's also only based on title and abstract. But here we are using, we are scanning the full text article in just, and it just takes 10 to 15 seconds, which actually improves uh, the speed quite a lot, can improve the speed in, the, in PV process. And the performance of these models, you can say it's ranging from, the performance of uh, these models, you can see they're ranging from 84 to 92% uh, F score, which is quite good uh, if you see, uh, uh, compare with other uh, prediction models that are outside in the in domain. And I think now you know there are some significant challenges around mining adverse drug reactions from the treasure and drug level. And some of the essential elements to build machine learning models is the goal set development, which is a challenging task depending on the complexity of the problem you're solving. So I think uh, uh, that's it. Uh, so we can uh, now take questions and discuss some uh, interesting uh, questions. Thank you, Umesh, for presenting us this really interesting subject. Well, at least I have learned a lot now from you about Go standard and the biomedical NER. And before I open the floor for Q&A, um, just a few housekeeping items for the audience again. So today's webinar is being recorded, and you will automatically receive the link to listen back to the webinar after this live broadcast. And the PDF of the presentation slides will also be made available afterwards. So now, Umesh, are you ready for the questions? Yep. Yeah. OK. So um, I think this question I got during the talk, can these models be applied to other types of content, such as electronic health records, so EHR? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, so uh, if, if uh, so you see in our the models that we built, these are based on FDA drug levels and literature for so we can definitely apply these models on different types of content but because the content type is different the language could be different so the performance could drop uh, of these models so for instance if we apply the models built on FDA drug labels on literature it might extract adverse drug reaction from the literature but the performance will not be that good as compared to the models that have been built on literature so we can definitely use uh, these models on EHR electronic health records as well, but be beware that the drop performance could drop. Okay. So let me go back as well. Hi, Umesh. How Embase and the Quota can help us in segregating the abstracts automatically as an ICSR and a potential safety concern? Uh, where is, uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, it's really in the beginning. Uh, yeah. uh, in the, how Embase and Quota can help us in segregating abstracts automatically as an ICSR and a potential safety concern? So uh, at the moment we are actually uh, uh, deciding or thinking to uh, add this functionality into Embase. Uh, so in that case, when we have the models uh, in the production pipeline uh, from Embase because Embase already have a lot of, a so like I mentioned, we can, one of the ways is extract these entities. Once we have the entities, we can say that these are uh, ICSR element or not. But another way, because we, like I mentioned, we have Embase which have been manually curated for a long time, which, and we are tagging that manually as an ICSR or not. We can use those to build a, a binary classifier uh, so these are two ways. So in uh, so definitely we can actually use as an additional model or a functionality in Embase where the documents are flowing in and can add these 
using these models as these are ICR, ICSR element or not. And because okay. we are picking up those drug reaction and seriousness, so then it can also answer the safety concern. I hope I answered uh, the question. Thanks. So let me go. Let's continue. What was the name of the tool that you used available free for building the GOAT set? It's BRAT tool, B-R-A-T. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. How frequently the GOAT sets are updated with new molecules, I guess, new data? Uh, that depends on, uh, uh, so at the moment when uh, we are putting this in production pipeline, so obviously this, this requires a feedback loop, which is also very important uh, to actually uh, keep your goal set updated. Uh, so depending on the frequency, that actually goes back to the uh, product requirements. So if we are putting in our product, uh, product needs to decide uh, whether it should be updated quarterly or monthly or, or maybe once in a year or twice in a year. Uh, because then you have to go back, add the, add uh, more information, or maybe you actually use the feedback loop. So whatever predictions are coming, uh, randomly you take out some of the samples predictions that goes to QA from the experts that we have in-house, and then that goes and feed back into the gold standard. So it can be continuous process as well. And with this continuous process, we can keep a track also how the performance of these models are varying because uh, it could be possible that we, when you add a, a data into your goal standard, uh, it might be possible you need to tune in uh, some other parameters for your, for your algorithm to improve the performance. So we need to crap, keep track also the performance of the models, how it's changing based on uh, the updates of the goal set. Thanks. So is the training data checked by humans? And if not, can you also share the machine learning approach you used to check the data? Sorry, uh, can you uh, say again? Ah, is the training data tagged by humans? Uh -huh. And if not, can you please share the machine learning approach you used to tag the data? So you are saying if, uh, so the question is if there is no uh, human annotator to annotate the document, mm -hmm. how we are annotating the document, right? Right, yeah. So uh, if, so the, the, then there are, uh, so one approach is uh, we call it as a pre-indexing. So then there could be dictionary-based approaches can be used. So we have several taxonomies in-house. Uh, which are also high quality taxonomies that we can use in order to uh, uh, identify those entities. So we can pre-annotate, pre-populate the adverse drug reaction or other type of entities so that we can, it can be used without human annotators and we can then use it for training the machines or we can send them to our human annotators to correct those pre-annotations. So this is uh, one of the approaches that we are using in other, other projects. Okay, thanks. Next question, can bootstrapping help if we have a limited training set? Yes, that's, uh, it, it can definitely help. The answer is yes. Okay, so let's move on. Is there a way to take into account spelling errors? I think there is another question related to this. Some ADR contains spelling mistakes, so how do you deal with them? Uh, so at the moment we are uh, using, for example, uh, a tool that that creates a kind of a graph of of uh, of letters. So that graphs of so from a dictionary you generate a graph of letters, uh, kind of a uh, like a knowledge graph of letters based on the dictionary, and that actually takes into account if there is a, some spelling mistakes that arise. So we can go into technical details also uh, in uh, follow-up discussions later on as well, if you want to have more details. Okay. Um, okay, so next question, Umesh. Is the uh, NER aligned with the MEDRA? Yes, all these, all the concepts and iterations that we are identifying, this is normalized to MEDRA concepts. Okay, thanks. 
another question we mentioned. Major cloud providers like uh, um, AWS and Azure offer medical tax entity extraction tools. Is it better to use those tools, or is it better to build everything by ourselves? Uh, well, uh, depending on the quality. Like I said, our uh, we have a domain knowledge. Uh, I mean, if you want to build a prediction model, uh, so I didn't, uh, to be honest, I didn't actually use Azure Microsoft uh, prediction models for uh, medical entity extraction. Uh, but I would say when you are extracting uh, specific domain information, you need to have some domain knowledge to validate the results. Or if you, that's usually the problem happens, we see, and uh, somebody is building a model without any domain knowledge, the performance, it's, you're not uh, evaluating the performance properly. So if you're saying it's 95% based on what you're evaluating the 95% as, as accuracy of the prediction model. So I would say, uh, uh, instead of building uh, your own models, first check what you are feeding into the machine, if it's properly tagged, if, it's, if you're using machine learning models, based on what you're looking for. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's move on, Umesh. I think this is with regards to the literature. So is the literature that you use for GoSet, is it global literature, or is it only from the EMA MLM? Does it also include the local literature content? Uh, where is it? Question. Uh, can you repeat again? Is it global literature it only, is or only. is the EMA uh, MLM and so local this, as this, well? So uh, in TAC goal set, uh, it's about uh, 200 drug labels that have been used. Uh, so we actually use a similar goal set in, uh, for TAG, and in ADE, uh, it is around, uh, hmm. uh, so this is not global literature, uh, so that I have to check. I can come back to you if you can answer me uh, again, or I can send you the details about the paper that we used, the data set that we used. Okay. Okay, thanks. So are you planning to integrate this innovation in your tools? So what would be the target to, to host this adverse event detection automation? And what is the current maturity or timeline? That's a really good question. Yeah, it's a good question. So we are actually building a business case to put this uh, tool into production pipeline. So I cannot really uh, exactly say that this is going to be live by this time. So. Uh, maybe let's have a follow-up uh, that we can uh, discuss uh, because uh, we are also probably be uh, uh, happy to partner or collaborate with uh, with you if you are looking forward to use it uh, because we can have a kind of a testing user so we can build it and improve the performances also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next question, Umesh. Even if the F score were ninety nine percent, it still results in all the documents having to be manually reviewed. So how do you deal with this? So let me see. It's an interesting question. Where is that question? Even if the F score were ninety nine percent, it still uh -huh. results in all documents having to be manually reviewed. How do you deal with this? So you're saying even even if the 99% that you're still missing 1% and you want to review all the predictions? All the documents manually. Uh, in the goal set or you're reviewing the predictions? Mm -hmm. so, um, I didn't get the answer uh, question properly. Let me see where is the question here. Oh yeah, here. Even if the F score were 99%, it still results in all documents having to be manually reviewed. How do you... So in this case, we uh, I think you you mean that you how do you review the predictions even if it's 99%? Uh, if I understand correctly, so in this case we obviously don't review all the documents. We actually randomly pick up the documents. Uh, so that's the cycle that we have uh, in house that we do. So we randomly pick a sample of documents at first, let's say around 200, 300 documents regularly, and we check what is the predictions, what if the predictions are correct or not. Uh, because obviously we always need some manual validation. We cannot really rely on machine 100%. So 
we believe in assist, uh, uh, augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. So we always, uh, uh, actually, in, uh, our, in our opinion, we should always keep humans in the loop. Yes. Thanks. Umesh, let's move on. How is the clinical argument factored in the gold set? And how are the case reports processed in the meta-analysis process for the ICSR or signal? Let's first look at the, the first question. How is the clinical argument factored in the gold set? Is it acumen or argument? I think argument. Acumen. Clinical acumen, okay, so I actually am not aware of judgment. this clinical acumen, yeah. or it's a document. I think it's a clinical judgment. It's okay, clinical so we are not, kind of... Yeah, we are not using clinical document here, so we are only using FDA drug label at the moment and literature. Okay, okay. Next, so can you explain the architecture? Well, that's, uh, I think that's a technical discussion. If you want to have, we can have it offline. Okay, so I will let you know who asked this question so we can follow up. Yeah. Um, how much improvement did you see with using all three data sets to run the BioVert model versus the single best one? Oh, I think I showed it. Let me go back to the slide. Here. Uh, sorry, here. So if you see on dictionary-based approach, <clears throat> with TAC we are getting 73%, but with BRAD, BioBird, we are getting 92%. So you see actually the precision and recall is also really high, good. Uh, with yeah. ADE, it was based, uh, on dictionary-based approach it was just 60%. With BioBird it improved to 84%. And the same uh, actually, also with LCV, our own goal set. What we didn't do is we didn't combine TAC and Elsevier goal set because uh, we wanted to keep it separate, but the next step we want to actually also check if we combine these different goal sets, then it will increase the size of the goal set and how will be the performances. Okay, thanks Umesh. Can we also apply these models for conducting literature reviews? Uh, Review in, a, in what sense? I'm not sure. How about, let's say, systematic review? Uh, put in definition here. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, but then uh, in systematic review analysis, obviously uh, you're looking for PICO, uh, the patient information intervention outcomes. So if you satisfy all these entities, I mean, if you need to add more entities, to uh, which are required for a systematic review analysis, then definitely we just need to tweak in and add more entities. It's just a different type of problem, but the pipeline can be tuned in according to that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so this is from the audience. Umesh, thank you for this excellent presentation. Is this technology being applied now to evaluate the literature for drug specific adverse events and the prepare reports? Uh, drug specific, so okay, so uh, there's uh, two things uh, that needs to be uh, uh, understandable here. Because in, in so here, the, all the adverse drug reaction in drug labels, uh, they are the relation or the link between the drug is implicit because a drug label is like a drug monograph and all the adverse reactions that are mentioned in that drug monograph is automatically saying that this is talking about that drug. So that's what we assumed. We started with that assumption. And uh, in literature, the difference is that the literature can talk about multiple drugs. So uh, we can, we, this, with this relations between drug and adverse reaction, we can extract drug specific adverse reactions. And we can say whether okay. this document or article is talking about this drug adverse reaction or that drug adverse reaction. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Umesh. Um, given the limited time, that was the last question for today. Some of the questions, okay. we actually still received the questions from the audience, as you can see. And let's try to answer them and put them into FAQ in our next blog post.
Um, and that will be the, the, the webinar that's it for today. And thank you, everyone, for, uh, for joining us today online and also for your really interesting questions. And I hope you find it useful. And if you would like to listen again to today's webinar or invite a friend and colleague to listen, it will be made available after this live broadcast with a short link going to your inbox. And with that, thanks again, Umesh, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, everybody, for joining the talk. And bye for now. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.